the more I read scripture, the more I study the Bible, the more I can see patterns. And I'm not talking about conspiracy theory, Bible codes, and, and you know, every tenth word, and all that kind of crazy stuff. I'm talking about patterns in the way that God works in our lives. Jesus purposely, every time he healed somebody, he did it a little differently. Because he didn't want people to think there was a magic word or some sort of a man-made process that you go to because then men in their carnal minds would start trying to copy the process. So Jesus kept it fresh every time he healed. One time he healed a blind man, he spit in his eyes. Another time he healed a bunch of lepers, he didn't even, he didn't say be healed. He didn't say anything. He said, go show yourselves to the priests. And the Bible says, as they went, they were healed. Jesus kept it fresh. So when I say patterns, I'm not talking about special patterns in, in, in how to get blessings out of God or anything like that. I'm just saying, I notice through scripture the way God works in the lives of people he loves. And there's a sequence for believers and if, and if we know, it's like if you're, going, if you're going to drive from point A to point B and you've been there before, you kind of know the route, you kind of know what to expect, that's what I'm talking about. Because when we can see these and know that God has taken us through these variations and stages in our life, we can better do exactly what Sister Felicia said. Know that we're starting off healed. Because God is working in every heart, every believer's heart. God is working in your life. He's got a plan for your life. And like everything else in this world that he's built and designed and created, there's a pattern, a process. It's a design. So he, he can do no less in our lives. So that's what I want to talk about today. That's why it's important for you and I as believers to not just be hearers, of the word, but to be doers of the word. Read God's word and do what it says. And we, we need to do our best to live up to the standards of God's word. The Bible says to know to do right and we do wrong. That's sin. And that can change for each heart. If somebody is prideful or unforgiving and, and there's another Christian who's not, there's going to, God's going to, there's going to be things in your life that if you walk into that God is trying to tell you this is sin for you, but it may not be for that person over there. There are sins that are absolute, that's for sure. But there's sins of omission and commission. And God personally will lead you into a spiritual walk with Him. And He'll speak to your heart individually. That's why we've got to continually seek His will for our lives and listen to that still small voice of the Holy Spirit because I'm telling you one word spoken from the Holy Spirit of God into your heart can absolutely change the course of your life I thought of something this week I hadn't thought of in years I've told you the story about I was going back to another church that we were working in and I was upset I was going to quit because I was just tired I had too many things going on in my life I had a a work life, a home life, and I was moving, had all these things going, and I was just done, tired. So I was going back to quit. And on the way, I began to call out to God, and I re started reminding, literally out loud, reminding God of all the stuff I'm doing for Him. <laughs> Lord, I'm already doing this, and, and I'm already doing that. See, I was feeling the calling for more but I was arguing with God. I was wrestling with the Lord because I didn't have any more to give, according to me. And I called out, what do you want from me? And I heard that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit say clearly into my spirit, I want it all. I shared that with you many times, but here's something that I hadn't thought of until I was reading some notes that I'd written in an old Bible, an old study Bible. See, I'd been praying for three years. I was new to, I grew up in a church that, that didn't 
celebrate the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was just kind of a sidebar to the events and, and to the, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to say which denomination it is, but I was, I, it had been several years since I'd been in a spirit-filled church and, and I found myself in one and I was thirsty and hungry for everything that God had for me. And I began to pray in my daily prayers, God, I don't understand a lot of this, but I want it all. If it's of you, I want it all. I want everything that you have for me. God, just mold me and make me into who you want me to be. And I started praying every day. I want it all. I want it all, God. Well, fast forward a couple of years. Now I'm down spiritually. And I cry out, what do you want from me? And God says, I want it all. I didn't think of that till this week when I was reading my notes because I wrote in my Bible, I want it all. I want it all. I want it all. I'd written in like seven different places, I want it all. I want it all. God says, before I give you all of me, you need to give me all of you. You see, we need to seek his will. One word spoken in your spirit can change the course of, of your life. Last week we came together at the Lord's table. We celebrated communion. We know the significance of the wine and the bread. But there's something deeper that God wants us to see when it comes to the breaking of bread. We're going to be in Luke 24. If you want to make your way there. A quick backstory leading up to our first scripture. Jesus had been mocked, arrested, beaten, crucified, died, was put in a tomb. Three days later, he came out of that tomb. He walked out of that tomb. All this just had happened. Jesus had just risen from the dead. But he hadn't yet shown himself to all the disciples. This is interesting and significant. The thing that I'm going to do a little different, we're just going to kind of walk through this scripture because I want you to see this. Jesus chose Instead of going to his disciples who were waiting for him to appear, they'd heard the word from Mary, from the Marys, that, that, that Jesus, was, his body was gone and that he had risen. And they remembered the, the words of the Lord that he had said. But before Jesus, and they were waiting in Jerusalem, as per the plan. But Jesus chose to show himself to two obscure followers. In fact, in this scripture, only one of them is named. There's a lot of conjecture about who the second one is. But Jesus decides to show himself to two lesser followers who had no idea what was about to happen. They had no idea that God was about to reveal a miracle to them. We're going to be in Luke 24. We're going to read verses 13 through 35. Before we start, Brother Joseph, would you lead our hearts in prayer? Father in heaven, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day and this togetherness. Pray that you bless this word and bless us with discernment and clarity. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Luke 24, 13 to 35 says this. That same day, two of Jesus' followers... Now, here's a word study for you Bible scholars. Some of the translations say disciples. Some say followers. There's a distinct difference 
between a disciple and a follower. Just like there's a big difference between a fan and a follower. So this is, that's just a little chum in the water for you. Go home and dig into it. Because in this scripture, there's a distinct difference between a disciple and a follower. And you'll see why in a minute. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along the way, they were talking about everything that had happened. And just so you know, everything that had happened was Jesus had been arrested and beaten and tortured and crucified and, and humiliated and mocked and, and the Jewish leadership and, and authorities just called him an, a heretic. They said he was of the devil. They said he was just another wannabe Messiah, but he wasn't really the Son of God as he claimed. Look at verse 16 or 15. As they walked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. Let's pause for a second because there's so many things happening here that show us how God works in the lives of believers. Notice how these two followers were going away from Jerusalem. They were going to Emmaus, seven miles away from Jerusalem in the opposite direction. So these two followers of Jesus knew that they were to wait in Jerusalem, but they were going home where they lived, to Emmaus. They were walking in the opposite direction of where Jesus was. Remember about this time, Peter had done the same thing. Peter was so grieved in his heart and embarrassed that he had denied Jesus. The Bible says that he just walked away, went back to fishing. And isn't it interesting how Jesus appeared to Peter and also to these two followers before he appeared to the masses? Why is that? Because he's the great shepherd and the shepherd will always leave the 90 and 9, who are where they're supposed to be, to go after the ones who are in the middle of walking away. You see it? So they're walking away from Jerusalem. Jesus himself appears. It says, Jesus himself suddenly came and become, uh, started walking with them. <clears throat> How many knows that Jesus, like he did with these people, will always head us off at the pass when we're going in the wrong direction. See, these were followers. You'll see in a minute the distinct difference. But they were followers, and, and they, they were walking away from where they knew they should be. They were walking away. They'd heard about the miracle. Of, they'd heard the, the, the lady's testimony that, that Jesus had, had risen from the dead, that his body was missing, but they were still walking away. God will always head us off at the pass to try to get us back going in the right direction. I'm so glad that when I was those people, I downgraded myself from a disciple to a follower for many years and just did religion, just did church. And finally, the world just... I, I was imbalanced. I had too much world. And I got tired of faking it. And God sent people into my way, into my direction, to try to lead me back. And it was many years of walking in the opposite direction. I was walking away from Jerusalem. I was walking to Emmaus. And many times, the Holy Spirit sent people in my way to try to head me off at the pass. And finally... He brought Linda into my life. And he redirected my life and got me headed in the right direction. This is how much he loves us. He waited years for me to get myself right. Praise God. So, verse 16, it says, uh, but God, so Jesus appears and he starts walking with them. Verse 16 says, but God kept them from recognizing him. 
It says Jesus himself, because there's a lot of people that say, well, it wasn't really Jesus. Maybe it was an angel or, or somebody else. But the Bible says it was Jesus himself. But they, God, kept them from being able to recognize him. I wonder how many times Jesus has come into our situation or our circumstance and we didn't recognize it. How many times when somebody who loves us gives us a word of wisdom and we're too busy walking away from God that we don't listen and we're inching our way away from Jerusalem. We've got to know. We've got to know when the Holy Spirit speaks to us either into our spirit, the still small voice, through His Word, or through other people that He sends to us. Verse 17, Jesus asked them, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short. Sadness written across their faces. See, Jesus knew exactly what they were talking about. But notice how his question stopped them in their tracks. Has that ever happened to you in sad times? In times when you're spiritually down or depressed? And things just doesn't, you don't feel like a Christian? Your life doesn't look like the life of a Christian and you're just down, nothing seems to be working out, and you, and you get down and you start heading in the wrong direction? And then you'll... The Holy Spirit will speak something into your, into your heart that will stop you in your tracks or you'll read something in the Bible. But here's something. I've done it with music. I've been, ah, and I put on worship music. And bam, something hits me. And the Holy Spirit stops me in my tracks. I love that about God. Verse 18 says, Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened the last few days. Now remember... Jesus was the only one on earth who fully knew and understood what was really happening here those past few days. Verse 19, look what Jesus says. What things? See, Jesus is he's being coy with them. What things, Jesus asked? The things that happened to Jesus. The man, remember that, from Nazareth, they said. This part's funny to me because... You know, without realizing it, they begin to, to, to try to teach Jesus about Jesus. He was a prophet. That's two. Who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher. That's three. In the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped, that's four, he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. Let's pause for a minute. This is how you know that they were followers, but not disciples. A disciple would say, Who do people say that I am, Brother David? You are the Son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the Christ. That's what a disciple would say. They said he was a man. They recognized him as a prophet and a good teacher. Does that sound like a lot of the religions of the world today, but they do not recognize him as God? The word says, we had hoped he was the Messiah, but blah, 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 but he was crucified. We thought he was going to come and rescue Israel. See, they were looking at it carnally through physical eyes. They hadn't received their spiritual eyesight yet. A, they didn't recognize him. And when they talked about Jesus, they talked about him in a fashion that didn't recognize his deity. So Jesus purposely, before he shows up to the crowd, to his followers, to his disciples, he goes, and first shows himself to these people, followers who had an idea but weren't convinced. Maybe that's why they were walking away 
from Jerusalem, the place where Jesus told them to go, because they'd hoped he was the Messiah. And when they, they, they were disappointed when they saw him arrested and die. That's why I always say every Sunday when I pray, we as believers need to know who Jesus is and who we are in Christ. We need to know that we know that we know, especially in this dispensation in history, because it's time for Christians to gear up. There's a spiritual battle happening that we've got to know all about. Amen? But they saw him die, and maybe they were, they were walking away because of that. Sometimes we as believers will do the same thing. When we pray for something and it doesn't turn out how we thought God should, we say, okay, Lord, here's my prayer, here's my problem, and here's how you need to fix it. We try to tell God how to fix our problems. And when it doesn't work out like that, maybe we get disappointed, and maybe that's why some believers walk away, and they, they walk away from Jerusalem. They walk away from the place where Jesus is, and start going home. Peter had just told Jesus, even if all the others deny you or leave you, I will never leave you, I will never desert you. I will die for you. And then he denies even knowing him three times. He was so embarrassed. He didn't turn out like he thought he would. He, did, he wasn't the spiritual warrior that he prided himself in his own mind in being. So Jesus is crucified, he's embarrassed, and he's walking away, and he tells the others, I'm going back to fishing. Jesus revealed himself to Peter, and he revealed himself to Cleopas and this other person. Look at the end of verse 21, reading on. It says, this all happened three days ago. They're still telling Jesus about Jesus. Then some women from our group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them that Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see and sure enough his body was gone just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. You find it so hard to believe. All that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Verse 27, then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and at the end of their journey. And Jesus acted like, I'm sorry, acted as if he were going on. This is key. Remember when the disciples were in the storm on the boat? And Jesus came walking on the water towards them and they, some, they thought it was a ghost. And the Bible, in one of the Gospels, the Bible says that Jesus walked by the boat. Hey, how's it going? Like he was going to keep going. He, 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 and, and it says that. As he intended, he walked on by like he was going to walk on by him. And it wasn't until they cried out for help. Jesus, help us. If this is really you, command me to come and walk towards you on the water, walk to you on the water. Jesus said, yeah, come on. Jesus did the same thing with the disciples in the storm that he did with these people. It's like, stay, come, stay with us. And he, he acted as if he was going to keep walking. Jesus, this tells us that just like the Bible in the storm, wasn't it obvious to Jesus that the disciples needed help? They're all freaking out in a boat. Ah! And then they see a ghost on top of it, and then it's, ah! And Jesus is just going to walk by them? This is a Bible principle that Christians, we need to realize, because it shows us that Jesus won't always automatically intervene in our crisis, in our doubt. It's when we cry out to him from the heart that he came and walked back to the boat. It's when we have a heart cry from God. God, I need help. Lord, I can't handle this addiction. I can't handle this pressure. Lord, I can't handle this person in my life or this situation in my marriage. I can't handle this whatever it is. And when we cry out to him, 
and we say that we're powerless to do it, that is when God will always intervene. But it's not always how we want him to intervene. Amen? Jesus will never push his way in. That's why Romans, or Revelation 3.20 tells us, Behold, I, Jesus, behold, I stand at the door and knock. We have to open the door and invite him in. And when the terrified disciples cried out for Jesus to save him, they did. Praise God, and that's what he'll do with us. Uh, in, in, in verse 29, back to the story, he's walking along, Jesus, with these two followers. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. They begged him. They cried out to him, please, stay the night. So he went home with them. Look carefully what happens next. This is the part that really spoke to my heart this week. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and he gave it to them. You recognize that? This is interesting. Because on the whole seven mile journey, Jesus walked with them. He spoke with all authority. He told them all about himself through all of the prophets. Starting with Moses, and ending with Malachi. He walked, he preached, he talked, he led. Still, their spiritual eyes were closed. They didn't recognize him. But when he sat down at the table to eat, Jesus does something that's so ordinary. You've got to know, at that time, in that place, the breaking of bread at the table was such a common, ordinary thing that everybody did it several times a day. It was something so ordinary and common that Jesus did. But watch what happens in verse 31. Suddenly, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he walked and talked with us on the road and he explained the scriptures to us. And within that, in the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. See, that's what I'm praying happens to somebody in this place today. Somebody within the sound of my voice that that, that is what's going to happen. That all of a sudden, your spiritual eyes will open to your situation or your circumstance and God will will intervene. Suddenly, their eyes were opened. All the wisdom that Jesus spoke with couldn't do it. All the knowledge he had of scriptures couldn't do it. But when Jesus did something that was so common, so ordinary, immediately, suddenly, their eyes were opened. See, this is the way God works in our life. We just have to rip, we just got to know how to pick them out and see them. Because after Jesus disappeared, they started recalling, oh man, how did we miss it? Didn't our hearts burn when he walked with us on the road? Didn't we? Didn't we? Shouldn't we have? Why didn't we? <clears throat> how many times has that happened to you? I can look back through my life and, and, and while it's happening, it seems like just random acts, you know, planets colliding and everything crushing together and crisis is coming in and we're just like juggling cats. It's like juggling angry cats, right? And then when you look back at what God has done, when your spiritual eyesights are open, you can look back for 20 years and say, ah, God, 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 that trial, all God, that crisis, all God. Because it's in our weakness that he speaks the loudest, that his strength is the greatest. But there's a process that we need to see. That's what I'm going to get to. So they, Jesus disappeared. 
The Bible says they immediately got up and started making their way back to Jerusalem. If you're here this morning and you know in your heart between you and God something had happened in life and you're walking away from where God told you to be, could be a church, could be a calling, could be something simple and everyday and ordinary. And God is trying to minister to you, but you're walking in the wrong direction. My prayer is that today you will say, Lord, open my eyes. Because again, it wasn't Jesus' words and wisdom that did it. It was something ordinary. We can witness all we want. We can tell our co-workers all about Jesus. We can take them through a Bible, Bible 101. We can preach to them every day. Take them all through the Scriptures. Show off all we know about it. We can argue points with people. No, that ain't right. Here's what God said about that. And we can feel real good about ourselves, but God may not be in that at all. But when they see ordinary way that you live and you love and they see God in you when you don't know they're looking those are the moments that will preach in the lives of every believer this is what God is trying to get us to see it's in the ordinary it's in the job it's in saying grace at the table not for show but wherever you are Amen. So after that, at the end of verse 33, it says, there they found the eleven, when they went back to Jerusalem, the eleven disciples and others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord is really risen. He appeared to Peter. And they're thinking, oh yeah? Wait till you hear what happened to us. And Peter probably got there 10 minutes before and said, you all got to hear what just happened to me. Because Jesus, the great shepherd, before he came to those who were okay, who were where they should be, who were waiting in Jerusalem, like he said, and obeying his word, before he came to them, before he tended to the 99, he left for the one, for the two, for the three. And I guarantee you that Cleopas and his companion may have started off as followers. The scriptures don't tell us, but I guarantee you when they went back with the testimony of what God did in their life and they, they had gone away from church and then God dealt with them, revealed Himself in something column. They saw Jesus in something common. And they went back to church. And they went back to where everybody was gathered. And they said, "You got to. Jesus came and He saved me. Jesus brought me back. Because Jesus left the ninety and nine. And went after the one. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 35, then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. There's a much deeper lesson here for us to see. This is something more spiritually deep than just share, Jesus sharing a meal with two of his followers. Because it said they immediately recognized him when their spiritual eyesight suddenly kicked in as he broke the bread. Look at verse 30 one, one more time. Verse 30 says, as they sat down to eat, because this shows us this pattern that I'm talking about, this common pattern that God works in every believer's life. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread, and blessed it. Then he broke it, and he gave it. He took it. He blessed it. He broke it. And then he gave it. 
If you go back to Luke 22, when Jesus ate the Passover meal, the Last Supper with His disciples, He took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And He gave it. And then if you back up to Luke 9, when Jesus fed the 5,000, He took it. He blessed it. He broke it. And He gave it. This is a process all through Scripture that's screaming at us, look at me. Because we as believers need to know that every believer is in one of those four stages 24 hours a day for their whole Christian life. You're either being taken, blessed, broken, or given. This is a pattern that God works through our lives. In 1 Corinthians, when Paul instructs us how, the church, how to take communion, he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread and he blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it. This pattern has a deeper meaning that God wants us to see. And it's not only indicative of the way God handles bread, the way Jesus handled the bread, because it's the way He handles every life who will open the door. What did Revelation 3.20 say? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who opens the door? Anyone who opens the door, this is how God will deal with your life. Because look at Revelation 3.20. I don't know if I put it up for you, Paula, but it says, Behold, I stand at the door at knock and knock. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him. And he with me. I will come in and sup with him. I will come in and break bread. If any person hears my call and invites me in, I will come in and I will break bread with them. In other words, he's saying, if you let me in, I will come in and begin this process. It's going to be carried on throughout your Christian life. Hallelujah. We see this in the lives of most of our biblical heroes. We can see it in Abraham from the beginning of the bloodline. God took Abraham away from Ur and the Chaldeans, the land of the Chaldeans, took him out of his home. And he blessed him with riches. But then he broke him because his wife couldn't have, have children, which led to all kinds of different things. But then he gave him the son that he promised. And he let all kinds of time go by. Time for doubt. He left a long road wide open to walk away from Jerusalem towards Emmaus for Abraham. And Abraham got almost all the way to Emmaus. And God came through with the promise. And not only did He promise him a son, He promised him a lineage that would outnumber the stars in the sky. So God took Abraham, blessed him, he broke him. Then he gave him the promise. And that pattern continued on in the life of that little boy that they had, Isaac. God took Isaac from the womb of a barren woman. And he blessed him. He was the heir to the promise. But then he broke him when his dad dragged him up on top of the mountain of Moriah and, and laid him on an altar willing to sacrifice him. But then he gave him to be the first generation of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Joseph, Moses, same thing. God took Moses, put him in a basket, sent him down the river, allowed him to be saved when the wicked king demanded that all the Hebrew boys two years and under be killed. God saved Moses, took him. He blessed him. 
by letting the daughter of the pharaohs find him in the basket hung up in the reeds in the river. She took him into the palace and he was raised as a king, so God blessed him. But then he broke him because Moses had to leave. But then God went and made him the leader of his people. Do you see how this pattern? Joseph, Jesus, all through Scripture, we see this pattern of God taking, blessing, breaking, and giving. This is what happens in the life of every believer. And when we look back through our lives, we can see how God used this same sequence or this same pattern in our lives. So when we take communion, we remember everything about Jesus, not just what He did for us, but who He is to us and what He means to us and what He's done for us. So we remember it all. We remember that He willingly came God says, you willing? Yeah. God took him out of glory. Blessed him. Broke him on the cross. And then gave him to us in the form of eternal life. Now we get to share in that promise. Isn't that beautiful? I love this pattern. It's not always fun, especially when we're in the, in the breaking stage. The taking stage is fun, but I can tell you that when God takes you and you say, yes, Lord, I'll go, when He's calling you for something and you say, yes, Lord, I go, He doesn't let you see what's behind door number two. So you walk blind with faith to wherever He's taking you. And He'll bless you, but He'll also break you so He can give you. Amen? These two followers on the road to Emmaus thought that Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom and overthrow the Roman government. So many people think that today. Don't let this election pit your concentration. If it doesn't go your way, and I don't want to even know who you're voting for or whatever, but there seems to be this great divide in this nation during this election. But we've got to understand that it's God who places kings and leaders. So don't let it mess with your faith. Don't let it get you down. No matter what happens. Because I guarantee you, when you read the book, God wins. Amen. Ultimately, God wins, but there's got to be a lot of things happen that have not happened yet. Some good, some bad. Mostly, uh, in the world's eyes, mostly bad. But sometimes in the taking stage, when God is moving us into this new, new reality, sometimes it can be uncomfortable. Nobody likes it when we're in the breaking stage, but here's what I want us to all see. It was in the breaking of the bread that their spiritual eyes were opened. Anytime God, you invite Him in, and you go through that breaking stage, you need to stand on your tiptoes and sit on the edge of your seat and wait for the blessing that's coming. Because God is about to take your life and do things that you never imagined that you could do, but He's doing them through you. Because it's in the breaking stage that their spiritual eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. And I can honestly say that everything that I've learned in my own life about the breaking stage, I realize that whenever God is taking me through the breaking stage, it's only because He has a purpose for it. And it's a greater purpose than I could ever imagine. He breaks bread so he can give it. So he can distribute 
the blessing. In other words, it's in the breaking that he multiplies and feeds 5,000 with a couple of loaves and a few fish. If you're being broken right now, God is about to use you and expand far beyond what you can ever imagine you could do. God is about to expand that His way. So thank Him and be faithful during the breaking stage. That's why I love Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not disaster to give you a future and a hope. Sometimes God re God's plan requires that we be broken. And it's usually because He's going to spread it out and multiply it. Sometimes God will take you through all four of these stages in one day, in one situation. Boom! You ever had one of those days where one trickle-down thing after another? And then by the time you go to bed, you're praying, you've got victory. Sometimes God will allow you to go through all the stages in one day. Most of my biggest blessings is when God broke things in me. Things like pride. God knew that he had a good specimen. Rob, you're, you've got what I need, but i got to break this. Pride. Remember Naaman? He had to dip in the foreign river. Remember that? So God had to break me of things like pride and my own will. Grudges. Things that I held on to. God had to break those in me before He could distribute the blessing that He wanted to do through me. When He does that, when he breaks us, our spiritual eyesight comes into focus and we'll realize there's a power greater than ourselves and our own abilities at work here. And God wants to use you. Because God never distributes bread that He hasn't broken. Never. But the cool thing is, through the whole process, He's got us firmly in His hands. We never leave the Master's hands. If you'd like to support this church, this ministry, you want to honor the Lord with the worship of tithe and offering, you can go to ServantsHeartWorshipCenter.com you can do it online. You can click the Donate tab at the top of the home page. Then go down and click the yellow Donate button. Type in the amount you want to donate. Then either click the PayPal and use your PayPal account or the debit and credit card button and follow the instructions from there. Or if you'd like to send in a check, you could send uh, your tithe and, and offering to Servants Heart Worship Center at P.O. Box 1859. Spring Hill, Tennessee, 37174. I love you all so much. God bless you.